So welcome everyone and thank you for joining our Make Design Matter talk online. My name is Josine Lambert. I work as a project architect for Article 25. And we organize these talks to create a platform for uh, humanitarian <laughs> architecture from all corners around the world to inspire people, uh, to connect people and to exchange ideas really. Um, I will start with a brief introduction of Article 25. And then we'll have Kamal Chola, who is the design director of uh, India-based organization SEEDS. Uh, he will tell us a bit more about the projects they work on. And we'll, we'll finish with a panel discussion. If you have any questions during the talk, um, you can just type them in, in the chat on the right and uh, we'll get back to them at the end uh, of the talk. So we'll start with a bit more of Article 25. Um, Article 25 is named after the statement in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights um, that states that everyone has the right to adequate and dignified shelter. We envision a world where all communities have access to better housing, safe school buildings and effective clinics and hospitals. Good buildings and infrastructure are essential for accessing human rights and meeting the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. As humanitarian architects, we are driven by the belief that empowering people through design is key in achieving these SDGs. So who is Article 25? We are a humanitarian architecture charity and means that practically we design and build schools, hospitals uh, and homes in places where they are needed uh, most. We work uh, always with local communities to build uh, capacity capacity on the ground and to create a sustainable and resilient environment. Um, since our formation in 2006, we have gained experience around the world and have become specialists in designing and delivering projects in challenging contexts. So far, we have delivered more than 90 projects in 34 countries. Um, so we work on healthcare. Uh, more than half of the world uh, lacks access to essential health services. So in this image, you see a, a HIV patient in Myanmar, but without adequate hospital facilities. Um, uh, we design hospitals and clinics so that doctors and nurses can provide uh, adequate healthcare to, to their patients. And here you see a ward in the main building of uh, Yangon, Yangon General Hospital, a project that we have been uh, working on since 2014. We also work on education. One of five children in the world uh, are not going to school at all, like these displacement in Nigeria. We build schools in communities with the least resources and create inclusive educational environments for all, like the secondary school in uh, Gursi in Burkina Faso. We also work on disaster risk reduction because um, poorly built buildings endanger people's lives. Here you see a child that stands in front of her collapsed school in Petionville in Haiti um, uh, after the earthquake in 2010. So we designed and oversaw the construction of a new earthquake resistant school uh, in Petionville for the community. So that was a short introduction about Article 25. Uh, please don't forget to follow us on social media channels where you can learn much more about the organization and follow all the updates on exciting new projects, uh, get inspired and exchange ideas. Uh, so here you go. Um, and then I would like to introduce you to our speaker of today, Kamal Chola, who is the design director at SEEDS, which stands for Sustainable and Ecological Development Society. SEEDS was established in 1994 and has as ultimate goal to protect the lives and livelihoods of people exposed to disasters. Community-led design is at the core of SEED's design approach. Kamal has been working for SEED's for 10 years now and has a passion of exploring connections between nature, culture, architecture and the future. I will now hand over to Kamal so he can tell you a bit more about the projects that SEED's works on and about the ambitions of the organization. So over to you Kamal. Yeah, uh, thank you, Josine, for the introduction and uh, thanks Article 25 for giving me this opportunity. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. Um, so, so uh, Josine has already briefed you about, uh, about seats. Um, so uh, we uh, mainly work in uh, India. Our implementation projects uh, 
are spread across Indian subcontinent, and we are also a part of various organizations across Asia, where we get to share and learn from each other. Uh, we share our experiences uh, uh, with each other and develop strategies for future. And at Speeds, our prime objective is to build resilient communities through innovation. Um, by innovation, we mean uh, we don't mean only invention or being unique. Um, in humanitarian sector, many times um, it is actually about adaptation or combination of various existing solutions that are appropriate. So appropriateness uh, uh, comes on top of priority list than uniqueness. And uh, innovation could be about reviving traditional innovation um, or enhancing our local or frugal innovation. It is not limited to a uh, product always. It could also be a process. Um, for example, process of engaging the stakeholders in any development pro uh, project, making it a community-driven program through participatory approaches is also an innovative process. So um, I'll take you to some of our work and share our experiences, uh, uh, which we have had so far while working in low resource settings. Uh, in and around India uh, with local communities and I'll try and finish it uh, in around 20-25 minutes. So let me share my screen with you now. Just give me a second. So the first project I'm going to talk about is our work in uh, Assam. Uh, Assam is a state in northeastern India. Uh, it's a valley in the eastern part of Himalayas along river Brahmaputra. And uh, it is also India's largest uh, bamboo reserve. Um, with its tropical monsoon and rainforest uh, uh, climate, it experiences heavy rainfall and gets flooded almost every year. And it also falls under the highest seismic um, zone of India. So to cope with uh, recurrent flooding and earthquake risk, the local communities have developed um, indigenous uh, techniques using local materials such as bamboo, uh, houses on, uh, um, on stilts um, uh, like these. But because of haphazard development in the region, the traditional knowledge systems are being ignored and uh, they are not really maintaining their traditional uh, uh, buildings. And they prefer to uh, build buildings like this, uh, which look more permanent, uh, but ultimately they are actually unsafe in case of flooding or earthquake. Uh, so uh, they prefer building with brick and concrete, uh, but actually uh, the, uh, the local um, um, uh, skill set is not there to build with such material. So in 2017, uh, uh, after the floods, uh, we worked there with our local partners' uh, needs and we developed a program to build around um, uh, 80 uh, post shelters as part of community driven reconstruction program and uh, took us about uh, more than three months uh, for the entire community consultation and design development process um, in the beginning the community was actually more interested in uh, brick and concrete housing typology as others have in cities but eventually they understood the benefits of uh, bamboo and then we came up with, um, with uh, consensus and started our uh, program. So this is the design of the uh, core shelters that we built. Uh, the structural frame is in local bamboo species, which is good for uh, construction. There are particular species that can be used for construction purposes. Uh, and it is based on the vernacular typology of Assam. The houses are on stilt uh, and the stilt floors are actually flexible. They can um, be further raised up in case of high flooding. So already the height of the stilt is about, uh, is about uh, two meters, which takes care of recurrent flooding. But sometimes the uh, level of the flood goes uh, as high um, as three or four meters. So in that case, they have to raise the floor further higher. 
and uh, we uh, improved upon the uh, uh, the conventional and traditional building techniques like we added cross bracings uh, to make it uh, um, uh, safe from earthquake uh, uh, we improved the foundations we made them more deeper and uh, uh, for uh, bamboo up to still height to make it waterproof it was coated with rubberized coating and these are some of the images of the construction process. These are the joinery details, which are based on uh, indigenous uh, construction techniques with some improvements. So it's a combination of carpentry uh, uh, joint and uh, tying techniques. In the beginning, we used uh, uh, nylon straps for tying, uh, but after building the prototype, we uh, received more inputs from the community and they said the uh, the nylon straps could be cut uh, mm -hmm. by the rats and ultimately they can actually cause uh, damages to the houses so it can survive the earthquake but the rats can actually uh, cause damage so we changed the uh, tying material from uh, nylon strap to gi uh, bias so for the structural frame, uh, we trained local masons. They built the uh, structural frame. But for the uh, wall panels, um, it was mainly done by the families themselves. And it is a traditional practice in Assam that uh, uh, when they have to build walls, so all the uh, uh, neighbors, they come together uh, for the last couple of days uh, uh, to help the family uh, finish their house. And then they have a piece together. And there is a, a, a name for this entire uh, cultural practice. It's called uh, Hariya in Assam. Uh, these are the uh, photographs of uh, some of the finished uh, houses. And since it was um, a local uh, uh, use of local materials, so the community could actually develop their own aesthetic. So, we gave them uh, only the skeleton and the skin, but they developed their own aesthetics around the uh, house. They also expanded the house uh, for their other uh, functions, such as kitchen, or if they need extra rooms for those purposes. And the stilt, while it is there to save them from floods, it is also used for uh, multiple purposes, uh, for kids uh, uh, as a play space, and uh, commonly used um, um, uh, for their hand loom. It's a cultural practice for all the women in, uh, uh, in Assam. Uh, so they are into weaving business uh, in general. And uh, so this was uh, uh, done in 2017 and 18. And once we uh, were finished, we were done with our work, um, uh, the community they faced floods in 2018 and 19. So these houses have already faced uh, two uh, flooding seasons and so far they have been performing quite well and the height has been height of the stilt has been sufficient enough uh, uh, the flood level has been gone higher than the, um, the height of the uh, stilt that was proposed. So yeah that has been a success story behind this project. The next project I'm going to talk about is our work in Leh. Uh, so Ladakh is a, a cold desert. It's our trans Himalayan region of India bordering Tibet. And it is considered as a rain shadow zone. It does not really rain over there. And you will find these small oases scattered across the valley where you will have a small water stream running from the glaciers. And you will have a small settlement of like 100 to 200 houses um, along these water streams. And their housing typology is generally, uh, they build with uh, adobe blocks, sun-baked uh, mud bricks. And they have tapered wall uh, uh, to make it uh, safe from earthquake. And they have horizontal seismic bands in, uh, in timber. But in case of 2010 floods, so generally it does not rain uh, there. But in 2010, it was hit by unprecedented scale of uh, uh, flash floods. 
and the community had not actually seen or heard uh, of such an incident in recent history and they were not really prepared for it and uh, in the flash flood since it was not just water but it came with force along with mudslide and boulder so it caused a massive damage to both uh, the uh, mud buildings as well as concrete structures so we started our program immediately after that uh, flood happened in um, august and uh, generally by november beginning they have a snowfall in uh, in ladakh so we in total only had about uh, less than 3 months to uh, uh, for our response program and for about a month was only gone in decision making and developing prototypes so we didn't spend too much time on experimentation and research we adopted a uh, uh, worldwide accepted uh, technology like stabilized compressed earth block because earth is available there in abundance and if you add some bit of cement in it you stabilize the block which becomes uh, uh, water resistant then and in that case it can actually survive in case of an earthquake so we started setting up such a uh, uh, um, such uh, block making yards at different locations in leh and this is uh, the kind of houses we were building um, since it is a cold desert the temperature goes up to uh, like minus 20 or 25 degrees in uh, winter so the houses need to be uh, well insulated and the um, uh, the uh, the uh, heat from the sun uh, should be captured as much as possible so all the south facing walls were turned into trombe wall it's a french technique where you paint the wall in black color then put a glazing in front of it so that it captures all the heat during day time and uh, gradually by night time it starts transferring so even during night also the house is warm from inside so the uh, southern wall was converted into trombe wall and the other uh, external wall were insulated uh with double wall system where we used uh, sawdust the uh, waste from uh, saw mills as insulation so uh, we built uh, uh, 15 such four shelters uh, in uh, two months time uh, before the winter uh, started setting in and then for the next summer when we continued our program so during the winter time we had time to do further research and uh, develop our designs further and we actually realized in 2010 when we worked there that the uh, stabilized compressed earth block is not going to work there for long uh, once we leave that space the community will not be able to take it uh, forward for two reasons one is that these uh, manual machines the efficiency of these manual machines is not as good as uh, as other places is because at other places if you are able to produce more than 1000 blocks uh, in leh we were only able to produce uh, maximum up to 500 blocks a day and the only reason was the entire process was quite laborious and the oxygen level is so low so people cannot do such labor intensive work over there so that was one realization and the other was uh, the the artisans the masons in leh they were used to building with working with adobe blocks which had a different size and proportion so the uh, bonding of the masonry the junctions and everything were totally different from the uh, standard brick size or the stabilized compressed earth block so uh, we had to be there for full time supervision uh, during construction when we were building with stabilized compressed earth blocks in 2010 so yeah we realized that the community will not be able to take it forward once we leave the project so we decided to uh, uh, go back to the traditional technique and uh, do a bit of enhancement in that only and be little more careful about site selection from flood safety point of view so uh, then uh, the typology was more or less same as the traditional one the changes were that the plinth was made little higher the uh, uh, mortar in the plinth and the pointing of it was done with cement to make it uh, water resistant and then instead of rtc bands which were used in the previous uh, uh, design we replaced that with local timber seismic bands and for uh, vertical strengthening of the corners we introduced 
buttresses like what you see the buttresses in the corners that are jetting out and you also see the seismic bands at plinth level and at roof level and then you plaster it with uh, uh, with mud only uh, to further strengthen the plaster you add uh, chopped straw in it and also apricot pulp uh, the apricot pulp acts as adhesive in the plaster and uh, apricot is the most common fruit available in Ladakh. And people, uh, traditionally they used to use apricot as an adhesive in plaster and other construction work. And this is again the same from the wall um, technique. And in this slide, what you see on the, uh, in the picture on the left, uh, they are putting uh, an insulation layer on top of roof. It's a local grass called Yabze. Uh, since the uh, humidity level is very low uh, in Ladakh, so uh, such material, they don't really decay. And we, while doing our research, both uh, desk research as well as in the field, we found that actually th these kind of materials have been used in old monasteries and palaces and they are still there it's been like around four to five hundred years and they are still there as it is so these materials they do not decay and they work really well as uh, for insulation purposes so uh, this is used on top of timber roof uh, as insulation and then further um, for uh, uh, for insulation, they add another thick layer of mud, and then on top, it's a, a rich clay uh, layer for waterproofing. And these are the photos of the finished houses. Then other than houses, we also got involved in building community um, centers in two locations, uh, two villages. Uh, we had our uh, community consultation meetings with the community to involve them in the whole process to understand their requirement. And we uh, started building two different uh, uh, typologies. Uh, one was in stone, what you see on the right, and the uh, what you see in the left on the left is in ram dirt. Um, uh, the reason for two different typologies, we initially wanted to work with earth only, but uh, in this one of the cases, the community already had a stone, some amount of stone with them, and they said actually it can be used uh, for uh, uh, community center construction. And there was a query nearby which from where we procured more uh, uh, stone. And the, in the other case where we uh, did it in Ramdar, the local soil was quite suitable for rammed earth construction. It, has, it had the right amount of clays and sand content in it. We had to add a little bit of soil from outside, which was also not from a very far away, for about two to three kilometers away from this site, we got another uh, type of soil. And when we mixed both these uh, soils, uh, it became the, uh, uh, the right uh, kind of soil, which was required for rammed earth construction. And these are the uh, images of the construction process. And here also you see the same buttresses and seismic bands as you saw in case of the uh, shelter. Uh, these are the uh, roof details. Since the uh, span of the uh, community center was quite uh, huge, so we use the same technique which they generally use in case of mon uh, monasteries. So same kind of wood, same kind of roof pattern was applied even in this case as well. That's the uh, entrance of the community center. And since this particular site was on, uh, uh, on terraced land, so a retaining wall was to be created. So we used two techniques. Uh, one was the gabion mesh with stone, and also we used uh, waste tires, which the community uh, uh, brought themselves from different places and built a retaining wall uh, uh, around the community center. So that's how the community started participating in different ways. And uh, yeah, that's the retaining wall along with the uh, community center. And um, so the community would come uh, every weekend to work at site uh, uh, and they also donated 
uh, material like uh, willow stick, which is used for uh, roofing, as well as the local timber for beams and other structural purposes. Because these uh, species, they grow in their own houses. So it was easy for them to donate for the uh, uh, community center and contribute um, towards it. And while we were working there, so yeah, so we actually had a community of different age group uh, from elderly to uh, uh, kids as small as like five year uh, young kids. And uh, they contributed in different, uh, in their own way. That's the uh, final image of the uh, community center. So while we were building these community center, we uh, received a, a, a very interesting comment, um, or I, rather I would say a compliment from the community. They said, you are actually building it so carefully using the traditional techniques, the way they used to do it for their monasteries, so that they would actually then, if we are doing it so carefully and with so much of care, so they said, they'll do uh, whatever you want uh, to contribute towards this. So that's how they brought material from different places, all the local material, and helped us in building the center. Then we also built community uh, toilets around these centers. Um, these are dry, uh, dry pit uh, based toilets. Um, generally, in Leh, they have dry pit uh, toilets. So, what you see the bottom part in stone is the sewage pit, and the top part is uh, the superstructure is in earth pack construction. Um, so in earth pack, actually you um, uh, fill the uh, Benny bags with uh, raw earth and the earth is, has to be of appropriate uh, 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 mixture of clay and sand and aggregate. And then you basically stamp these bags and then stitch them together. So the gunny bags basically hold it for the time being and over time uh, it gains further strength and even if the gunny bags, they decay, uh, but the wall is going to stay. That's the uh, final image of these toilets. And this is another interesting uh, 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 lighting intervention. So uh, instead of um, uh, using uh, conventional energy, uh, uh, we applied this technique, which was actually developed uh, earlier in Kenya. So they put bleaching powder in glass bottles and uh, during daytime, uh, when it captures sun, it further eliminates the entire uh, space inside. So since the purpose of these community centers was only for day use only, so that's why we decided that actually instead of installing a conventional lighting system, we'll install these kind of lights over here uh, to further save on energy. Um, that's the uh, that's another community center uh, in Ramda. Uh, that's how we envisaged it in the beginning. And that's the uh, section. So uh, the, on the right side is the community center. It has a, a greenhouse in front of it, which will help in growing local vegetables, as well as when it is covered with plastic sheet, it will also capture heat and then transfer it inside. So it will further help in keeping the uh, community hall warm from inside. And this section shows how uh, the transition happens from the road to the community center. So on the right bottom end is the road and as people move in, there are different activities, there are different spaces like seaters or a counter or a flat post. So there is a transition as you move from road to uh, the community center. And uh, uh, on the other side of the road was actually the village, which also be connected with the pathway. Um, so these are the photos of the construction process. Um, so on the uh, left hand side, you see the ramming uh, process. It was done manually only. And um, on the right, what you see is a small tool called a uh, penetrometer, which helps in checking whether the ramming has been done properly or not. So you don't really need any sort of machinery to build with these kind of techniques, it was all done manually. Uh, this is just to show uh, the texture of the uh, rammed earth wall. 
this is from inside with some uh, 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 my new details like niches, how you create niches within the uh, Ramdas wall. That's again community working together uh, uh, in finishing the community center. And here also what you see these thin, thin timber lines, horizontal timber lines. So these are, uh, again, they again work as uh, seismic bands. So we put these uh, full seismic bands at, uh, 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 at sill level, lintel level, and roof level. But in between, uh, also we put smaller bands at corners and various uh, junctions. This is something which we learned from Sikkim. Uh, uh, in Sikkim, they uh, work with these kind of uh, techniques, which has a similar uh, geoclimatic condition as clay. Uh, this is the finishing of the roof overhang. This is again a traditional style uh, where they use willow stick and color them in red because uh, um, uh, red color is celebrated in, in Buddhism. Yeah, that's the image of the almost finished um, center. Again, the uh, interior details with uh, niches. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Um, thank you everyone for uh, listening. So now over to Bo and Sunan. Um, so I'll stop my screen share. And um, Sunand, if you come in and initiate the discussion. Wow. Thank you very much indeed, Carl. That was uh, inspirational. And I have a lot of questions to ask and we'll have a fantastic sure. conversation, I'm sure. Uh, just to introduce myself first and then to introduce Bo. My name is Sunand Prasad. I'm the chair of Article 25, uh, and you've heard all about Article 25 already. You don't need to hear more about that. I'm an architect. Uh, I have lived in the UK for most of my life and have had a practice, Penoya and Prasad, uh, now a part of Perkinson and Will, and we've been going for 32 years this year. Um, and I've been very interested in sustainability and these, the kind of architecture that Kamal is describing, although our own practice is very different from, from that type of architecture. So over to you, Bo, and then what we'll do is have a, a conversation. Thanks, so thank you for um, inviting me to, and um, thank you for such a lovely, uh, inspiring talk, um, Kamal. So just, just a bit about me, I, I'm a senior lecturer at the School of Art, Architecture and Design at London Metropolitan University. Um, I'm involved in a research group called the Architecture of Rapid Change and Scarce Resources. Um, we've got experience working in um, low income uh, informal settings in India, in Nepal, Sierra Leone, um, and now Europe, uh, specifically in Greece, uh, where we've, um, we're very much interested and interested in live projects and, ed and education in architecture. Um, so we've carried out live projects with our students, including schools and sanitation systems. Um, and currently our interests are in um, learning from making, place-based architecture and city making through a loose fit approach. Thank you. Um, let's just start off uh, uh, talking about it. We've, we've got about, a We've got 96 people on this call, which is lovely, fantastic audience. Uh, welcome everyone, uh, especially from Article 25. And um, can I ask, start asking about the, the, the extraordinary amount of community participation that you achieve in your, in your project? And in relation to two questions particularly, one is what are the economics of that community labor? Uh, and, you know, is it all voluntary? Uh, how is some of it paid for, if it is? Uh, and generally some, some texture around that. And the other is about training and how you transfer the skills that you've accumulated over all these years of doing this, but combine them with the local skills. 
How could could you say something about that? Yeah. So, um, um, in some of the cases, the community they work only on voluntary basis. Um, for example, if it is their own house or if they are um, doing it only uh, once a while, then it is on voluntary basis. But if they are involved on regular basis, on daily basis, so then we also have cash for work programs. So it varies from uh, uh, projects to uh, project, uh, but uh, there are both both these situations are there. And does that uh, and and the origin of that money is is through charitable giving, uh, grants, yeah, and so on? Is, How do you raise it? Yeah, it is through grant only, and it comes uh, from project fund only. So and uh, and on the training point, how, how does the what the transfer of skills and training could you say something about that yeah so uh, especially in case of uh, our shelter programs uh, what we do we would initially build one prototype and uh, um, that helps us in uh, uh, develop our own understanding then to train the local artisans and also take inputs from the community because when you only have have discussions on paper the community they don't really understand everything but when they see it live then they are uh, able to give uh, more inputs. So that's one level of training. And then as we continue further, we uh, divide our program into small clusters. And at every cluster, we would build another prototype, which would further train the uh, local artisans. And our team of uh, supervisors will then move from site to site to, uh, uh, to check whether uh, the work is happening properly or not. If any further training is required right on the spot, that is also given. And we have also run a, a Mason Association for uh, earlier in Gujarat and Delhi as well for some time. And uh, for example, we had a Mason Association in Gujarat, which was first trained in Gujarat back in 2001 after the earthquake. Then they supported two of our programs. One was in uh, uh, after the tsunami in Andaman and Nicobar. So they worked there. And uh, then they were also moved to Kashmir in 2005 after the earthquake. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that association worked for about five to seven years. And then out of that Mason Association, some of them, they actually became contractors and they uh, started growing on their own. So then they, mm -hmm. not, they need our yeah. support later on. So yeah, so that's how, I mean, that's one of the examples how it has worked so far. So, so Bode, turning to, to you, and uh, especially the, the idea of your unit, which is about scarce resources, it, was, it struck me while Kamal was talking that although we talk about scarce resources in many ways, there are some fantastic resources available. You know, that they're only scarce from a certain point of view. In a, in a way, what the community and the local materials and the local traditions bring is its own wealth of resources. Absolutely. I mean, uh, just to build on the previous question as well, um, it's, it's a lot to do with um, a shared knowledge exchange rather than, you know, training yes. uh, from one side to the other. So this idea of exchange from learning from tradition, from indigenous um, building techniques and, um, you know, normal cultural practices is essential to these types of projects, um, particularly when I mean, in our experience as, as, you know, outsiders, as Westerners often working in these um, contexts, it's important for, for us to learn from um, the community before we even begin to offer our opinions on how things should, um, should be built or designed in, in, in places uh, that are unfamiliar to us. I mean, as outsiders we do, and as students, they, they bring fresh eyes, which is always a benefit too. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that we found quite a lot in our projects was um, this idea, um, I mean, Kamal, you mentioned it in your talk, um, this idea of the rejection of um, concrete and, and brick um, from our point of view. Um, it's an interesting one because, you know, we immediately say, let's use local resources, let's use, uh, you know, bamboo and things like that. But immediately the community are saying, why not use brick and concrete? And there is a very good justification there too, which is to do with um, status. You know, um, it's to do with this idea of um, poker and kutcher. So the idea of um, 
things that are proper against the sort of more temporary materials um, that are often um, viewed, I think materials that are often viewed as being temporary such as bamboo against permanent more um, high standing materials such as concrete and brick. Um, so it's, it's not a sort of very straightforward thing um, where it's one or the other, but uh, I'm just quickly glancing at the questions. I hope you don't mind Sunan as well, because somebody yeah. else has um, yeah. picked up on this idea of um, rural and urban contexts. Yeah. You know, when you talk about rural contexts, it's much easier to identify uh, traditional buildings and, and uh, vernaculars. But in an urban context when you know, cities are developing rapidly and they're all becoming in a way the same, you know, um, what's wrong with brick and concrete? I mean, there is a much wider global debate about concrete at the moment, you know. Um, but but when maybe a question there for Kamal is, uh, yeah. are, are you, is seed also involved in, in urban context? Yeah, we, we have worked in urban context as well. In Tamil Nadu, in Kerala, we have worked in urban context. And actually there we have worked with uh, brick and concrete. And uh, the, the problem uh, with brick or concrete is it's not always a problem, but uh, like one case I mentioned in case of Assam or even in Leh also, like that one image where you uh, saw the brick uh, house was actually settled down uh, because it's so heavy, it's not built on proper uh, ground. So the, if the ground is marshy, you can't build with heavy material, but you can build with bamboo on still, which is a light material and will also, you know, help you cope with flooding mm -hmm. situation. So in that particular uh, uh, scenario, actually bamboo is better. And the other problem with uh, brick or especially with concrete is that in such areas, uh, uh, concrete is supposed to be engineered. It is supposed to be designed, the RPC. Yeah. But here people are not able to hire engineers or architects mm -hmm. and they actually don't know uh, even the joinery of uh, basic junctions of beams and columns. So they won't connect them properly. And in case of earthquake, we have seen uh, that buildings have actually failed. So in many cases, the uh, RCC or brick construction uh, constructions have failed instead of the local vernacular uh, uh, buildings. So that is something which we have seen that people don't really have skill of building with concrete, but they still then uh, start building with it. So in that case, it does not work. But in urban scenarios where uh, that sort of skill set is there, mm -hmm. uh, then it can work. Yes, I'm, I'm sure that the, the fundamental principles of working with what you have in front of you and the yeah. intelligence and the, the desire to really look at what is yeah. there, starting yeah. from that position. And you know, it's so easy to say, but it's, it's, I think, a very special skill. And I think that everybody at Article 25 will admire you hugely for, for that intensity of, of the penetrating understanding of what is possible locally and to transcend that, to make some very beautiful buildings. So I wanted to uh, ask you a little bit about the design because actually a lot of the questions that we've got in front of us here are, of course, uh, so many designers on this call. We want to immediately start talking about the the um, uh, the, the the bands, the seismic bands, and all, all yeah. of that. But can I ask some of you know, that, especially that last building with its vert horizontal timber courses? Uh, it's it's to my mind, it's, it's a very beautiful building, and it it's not beautiful by accident. Uh, you know, someone composed it and yeah. and devised it. Can you tell a little story of how it came to look the way it did? Uh, okay, so um, okay, um, so uh, we started this building in 2011. Um, um, so for about two to three months of um, uh, time, the construction happened, and then uh, we took a break during winter, and then we came back. And during winter, I happened to visit Sikkim, and there I saw these uh, this particular technique of using these thin timber bands, and uh, there actually. So till then only the plinth work was done. And then after coming back uh, from uh, uh, Sikkim and then we changed our design and incorporated this. So this is a learning from uh, traditional typology yeah. only. Mm -hmm. And of course, some inputs from different people. Um, so we had uh, a team of uh, around four to five architects uh, mm -hmm. in May uh, for the entire program. 
Mm. Uh, we were taking inputs from local experts. Uh, um, uh, if you you might have heard of Tibet uh, Heritage Fund, uh, that's mm. an organization working in um, in Leh in Tibet and the Central mm. Asian region. So we uh, learned a lot from their architects. And uh, uh, there is a local engineer in Ladakh, Sonam Wangchuk, um, a very famous person. Uh, he has actually uh, brought in a reform in the education system. He's mm -hmm. promoting earth architecture. He's building artificial glaciers. So mm -hmm. uh, we actually learned uh, a lot from him as well. Wonderful. And then, yeah, and then when, because we were there for three summers, uh, so we interacted a lot with the community and mm -hmm. we had to move all the time. We were on the road all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. We would only come back in the night. So we interacted with uh, everybody, even our taxi drivers or any any uh, shopkeeper, any vendor. So we would actually, uh, you know, strike a conversation with them and uh, learn different things about mm. their culture, about mm. their lifestyle, mm. their construction techniques. Because one thing is that uh, people in rural areas they have time. Yes, <laughs> they are not like us. So you can actually um, um, uh, mm. sit and uh, chat with them. Mm. And uh, the other thing which I also personally learned as an architect before um, uh, before going there, um, so that was like kind of beginning of my career. I had uh, before that only three, four years of experience and I had worked mainly in Delhi. But it changed me a lot when I was there as a person. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I kind of, I mean, as they say, uh, I kind of became like a community uh, architect. So when we say uh, that the, um, we make the community you know, uh, engage in the whole process, uh, in the whole program. So we involve them, but also we have been lucky enough, uh, like uh, uh, most of our team members, or I would say all of them, they mm -hmm. also become part of the community. So it's not that uh, the community is becoming yeah. part of the program. We are also becoming part of, uh, of, that, yeah. of their lifestyle yeah. their, uh, yeah. of, the, of the community. So, so both, uh, yeah, so I mean, thank these you. Things actually help us uh, yeah. coming up with these kind of solutions. Wonderful. Bo, uh, did you, I mean, please chip in with anything you want to say, but I wonder if, um, you know, the, the, what the building communicates, as opposed to simply solving a functional problem, how much, how, how dear is that to your work in, in, in designing for places with communities with scarce resources? You know, the communicative power of the building as well as the solving of functional issues? Um, well, I think they go hand in hand in a way. I mean, it's, it's about the process as much as it is about, um, you know, solving the actual, pro the, the actual problem. It's that process you go through which um, gives the building agency, which then, you know, communicates, as, if that's the word you're using. Because um, I assume you're not, you don't, you're not talking about just the aesthetics here in terms of design. Um, that process reveals itself, um, you know, reveals a lot of things along the way, which are unexpected. And that's where things like innovation come in. Um, if you involve everybody in that process in, in this um, form of participation, then the building is continually communicating with everybody. Hmm. Well, there's some very technical, thank you, Bo. There's a couple of very technical uh, questions here. I'm just going to read a few out and Kamal just chip in as you wish and Bo you come into anything you'd like. Uh, there's a couple of questions about the adobe blocks and how they resist flash floods uh, especially and is there a kind of a maintenance regime that's associated with it and also about the sawdust and how do you stop that from deteriorating or being affected by vermin? Yeah. So um, the first one is about Adobe. So um, for that, I think the most important thing is site selection. So uh, traditionally, they used to build their houses uh, or any building on at a certain height on hillocks. But over time, they started building on the you know uh, pathway of water. I mean, there would be an inactive uh, uh, inactive water stream where they started building. So I think site selection is the most important part, and then the um, orientation also helps a bit. Um, if your wall is um, in the same, like uh, perpendicular to the direction of the water flow, then it's going to hit directly uh, by the water. But if 
if it is um, oriented at 45 degree then actually your water will you know hit the corner and then get bifurcated so these kind of things we have taken care of and as i said the uh, height of the plinth uh, also becomes important and uh, the strengthening of corners with buttresses if one has to avoid a uh, vertical steel reinforcement so these are the kind of measures mm -hmm. we had taken uh, in our uh, work and your next question was but just on the vermin and the sawdust yeah so sawdust we only use uh, in 2010 in the beginning because uh, 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 in 2010 we relied on others uh, uh, they kind of said that the local grass is actually not available so easily so it's better to use the waste material the sawdust so we had put sawdust in waste cement plastic bags so that was one way to protect it from moisture but actually the local grass is a much better material to use for insulation which we realized when we uh, got back in 2011 that what are the exact locations where one can actually source it Mm, thank so you. in the beginning, yeah. Bo, how does this work uh, uh, compare with other examples of such work around the world that you are familiar with, I'm sure? So, sorry, could you be a bit more specific? So uh, here's an example of a very local, locally targeted regional approach. How, how much more such examples, how many examples have you come across around the world? Of, uh, is it is this is this a uh, an exceptional example of of it or do you we, mean the work that, things like this you mean the th the work that seeds are doing yeah. yeah yeah i mean it's interesting because um i mean first of all congratulations on 25 years of fantastic work at seeds i mean that's quite um impressive um and actually um it's a reminder for us all um, just how important this work is um, to, you know, in supporting vulnerable communities through architecture and design. Um, but it is interesting because um, SEEDS is one of the first organisations I came across when I started my career 15 years ago. I've actually now, I'm seeing, um, you know, in the last five years, a um, huge number of um, small non-profit um, organisations practising architecture in these um, contexts, um, you know, which are springing up all the time, um, often um, set up by graduates who are, you know, rejecting the career in commercial architecture um, and those wanting to make a difference or just be more hands-on or just to create a, social, a more socially conscious architecture in places and contexts where it's needed. Um, but there are, a f you know, um, lots of examples we can list, but there are a few with such wealth of experiences um, and organizations such as SEEDS and I know you've been with SEEDS for quite a while uh, Kamal so I mean Mike actually I have a question for you which is because um, uh, I know that a lot of students are in this um, in this forum today uh, which is you know what advice would you have for these new organizations um, and practices who are setting up and trying to get into this kind of work um, what would you say to them? Um, so um I think uh, in today's time, uh, uh, it is not only about the uh, economy. Uh, we are dealing with uh, much larger issues like climate change and uh, uh, related to environment. So that's why the socially conscious as well as uh, uh, environmentally sensitive architecture is required. The only problem that we are facing that there is no market as such for these materials or construction mm -hmm. technologies. For example, um, uh, in many cases, what I saw that the uh, industrial material was cheaper than the uh, local material. Uh, the main reason is there is no market because uh, the local material or the natural material is a raw material. Nobody will be able to make much profit out of it. Uh, there is not much processing required, but whereas in cement or steel, you uh, 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 while processing, you uh, make profit. So that's why it you have a business model ready for it so i think uh, what is required for this kind of work i mean some sort of business model has to be created which fits in with the current global economic system so that's how um, uh, i mean uh, that's one way i think it can work fantastic um i think that's a great point to end it's two o'clock um Bo, did you have any last thoughts? 
Uh, no, no. Without expanding the uh, discussion again. That's now. right. I mean, there's lots I'm, I'm to ask yeah. about. And I think you be we begin to move into how do we make this more widely disseminated? How can more people do have access to such wonderful things? Because, you know, after all, we're only not even scratching the surface, you know. Collectively, mm -hmm. all of all such work, including Article 25, and even if there were 50 seeds and 50 Article 25s, will only just be beginning. How do we actually make that mainstream? Is of course the the subject that occupies us all while we battle with these giant forces, climate change, and of course pandemics, which are after all related to each other. Yeah. So. Thank you very, very much, Kamal. That was, as uh, Bo said, that's really inspiring. And uh, um, every, you know, it was just gorgeous to listen to you, uh, to see that wealth of knowledge and the humility with which you approach your communities and learn from them. Uh, as again, Bo said, it's a question of exchange of knowledge and information. It's not a one-way thing. That's something that Article 25 also very much believes in. And of course, we, we believe in leaving behind a legacy of people doing the things themselves, which I think you also do. So thank you all for participating. Uh, if, if you've um, asked a question that hasn't been answered, maybe um, I can ask uh, Article 25 staff to just maybe post these answers up uh, back onto a forum or back to everyone uh, so that Whoever asked a question can get something of a, an answer. Uh, thank you all for joining in today. Hope to see you again at the next Design Matter. Thank you, Bo. Thank you, Kamal. Thank you. Bye-bye, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.